unchanged since prehistoric times, sharks have roamed the world's oceans for over 200 million years. Superbly adapted to life in the sea, sharks are constantly on the prowl, constantly in search of prey. experienced underwater photographers, Ron and Valerie Taylor, devise a technique to allow them to study and film sharks at close range. Using Val as bait in their experiment, the Taylors set out to prove that only a few sharks are deadly to man. But when dealing with sharks, the unexpected Like multicolored birds of a tropical jungle, the fish of Australia's Great Barrier Reef are infinitely beautiful and varied. Diving into this world over 20 years ago, came underwater photographers, husband and wife, Ron and Valerie Taylor. World spearfishing champion in his early 20s, Ron Taylor quickly learned that it is more beneficial to film marine life than to kill it. Both tailors decide to somehow make their living in the sea. And over the years, they have photographed millions of feet of film, including features such as jaws and blue water white death. superb shark behaviorists, traveling throughout the world to obtain footage of many of the over 100 species. But now that they were being called upon to work closer and closer to these unpredictable hunters of the sea, they would have to find a way to assure both of their safety.
Ron searches for methods which will protect them while outside the cage. Always unpredictable. Feeding sharks will strike at anything. Ron and Valerie explain. Valerie and I are working in deep water off the San Diego coast for Alan Landsberg's television series, Amazing Animals. We plan to demonstrate how we can coax a performance out of wild sharks for the movie cameras. Distracted by two sharks near my head, I didn't see this one come. It grabbed my leg. Green blood clouded the water as the white saw teeth withdrew from my flesh. There was no pain, no panic, but I had to get out fast. It was entirely my fault I was attacked. I hold no grudge against sharks and look forward to working with them again. Oh, dear, look at all that blood. No, Ronnie, it's really bad. There's a lot of blood there. Get this. Get this off. Lay down, Valerie. Lay down. Sit down. Yeah. Lay down. Get your, get your leg up. Uh, somebody ought to get on the horn. Yeah. Check Coast Guard. Uh, we'll, just have a, we'll just have you a look know, at this I'm first. holding out the fish. Watch your mind, shark. We'll that... just have a look at it first. Oh, you want to know what it costs? Uh, oh, yeah, it's yeah. a bad one. Bad cut. I think you leave the wetsuit on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, a bad leave the on. Leave it on. Bad cut. Yeah, that'll, that'll have to be stitched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we work so often with these sharks, and Let now me, it happens. I'm going to check. Damn it, damn it! Oh. Why did he have to do that to me? Oh, that's a blasted nuisance. The rotten, stinking little shark. Yeah, they, Protection from the teeth of sharks would require a novel solution. Ron heard of a new material called malite, made from thousands of individually welded tiny stainless steel rings, interwoven into a flexible material. Gloves of malite were being used by butchers to protect their exposed hands from razor-sharp knives. If a complete suit could be made from malite, would it protect a diver from sharks and other deadly creatures of the sea? Hey, Valerie. Valerie, have a look at this. Obtaining a set of gloves, the tailors evaluate the protective quality of the material. It looks as though it might work. Even the sharp pointed teeth of a mako shark barely penetrate between the rings and these could be cushioned by the thick rubber wetsuit normally worn during a dive. With their first suit, costing about $3,000, the tailors traveled to the northeast coast of Australia to test the suit during one of their filming expeditions. But the suit has been made a bit too small for Ron. It won't fit over his thick wet suit. Now loosely, as usual, she is game to try anything. Because of its weight, the suit will take the place of the lead weight belt usually worn to make up for the flotation of the rubber wetsuit. 
Once in the water, Valerie finds she is properly buoyant. At least for diving, the protective steel mesh works well. Aided by the dive boat skipper, Bob Vile, a number of fish are tied to a coral head as bait for the reef sharks. Val readies her camera and settles down to see what will happen next. With fresh kill in the water, sharks assemble quickly. A baby gray reef shark approaches and cautiously circles Val. Testing first with lower teeth, it quickly clamps down with top jaw and furiously rotates its body to tear out a piece. Not having the steel mesh gloves, Val pulls her hand into the sleeve of the suit. Fish or finger would be all the same to this aggressive little shark. Now a white-tipped reef shark appears and swims straight at Ron's camera, then circles the bait. Not usually dangerous to humans and intent on the bait, the white tip grabs first one and then a second fish. It's almost too good an opportunity for Val, who fondly rubs its back and gives it a playful hug. teeth and jaws are very efficient. Now a larger white tip arrives and it too goes immediately for the bait. Establishing a firm hold, it furiously rotates its body to twist and tear off the hard backbone of the bait. scraps are dispersed by the feeding sharks, a school of barracuda pass close by. of the feeding sharks and with the blood in the water other sharks are attracted from hundreds of yards away. Smelling the bait, larger and more dangerous sharks arrive. A 
group of gray reef sharks are excited into a feeding frenzy. Ron recalls the incident. They are performing well for my camera when suddenly the unexpected. A frenzied shark smashes into the glass filter in front of my lens, forcing the heavy housing back against my face. I was momentarily dazed, not knowing where to point the camera. The shark was not trying to bite. It simply smashed into me with its snout. Thankful he was not hurt, they terminate their dive. Satisfied with their initial test of the steel mesh suit, Ron and Valerie travel to San Diego, where they will work in open ocean to film blue sharks. Here they are joined by Jeremiah Sullivan, a marine biologist from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Attracting the shark to the boat's stern, one of the crew grabs it by the tail as it swims by on the surface. All show proper respect for the razor's sharp teeth, even if they are out of their element. Wearing Ron's steel shirt, Jeremiah has added fiberglass reinforcing strips under his sleeve as protection from the crush power of the jaws. Much to his surprise, the shark exerts minimal pressure. It may be quite a different matter when tested underwater. Having served the experiment, the shark is returned to the sea. Closer inspection shows no damage to the suit. It has passed the test. Now Val, Ron, and Jeremiah prepare to dive with the blue sharks, drawn to the boat by placing fish scraps in the water. Even though only the top half of her mesh suit has been delivered, Val decides to continue their test. Jeremiah wears Ron's full suit. It's a clumsy garment, and the straps and buckles will take a bit of getting used to. As before, Ron wears only his rubber foam wetsuit, protected by his camera, sometimes a good weapon, and not baited as the others, he feels quite safe. Scraps have done their job, and more blue sharks arrive by the minute. Unprotected from the waist down, Val now has her hands full, attracting sharks with fish, dodging others, and watching out for a sudden hungry intruder from the rear. Fully protected, Jeremiah invites a bite as more blues gather. Nearer the 
the surface, Val is becoming the center of attention. Surviving for hundreds of millions of years, sharks are extremely cautious, unsure of these new animals in the water, but smelling the bait, they seem to hesitate before making an attack. and aggressive, the sharks try to bite Val's body and arm. They come from all sides, some unexpected. their bottom teeth in first, as if to test the food, and then clamp shut from the top. Val's reaction is controlled, but she is barely able to suppress moments of panic as the sharp teeth rake her arm. to totally control her fear. With her arm clasped in fearsome jaws, as the great head is thrown from side to side, Val pounds with her fist to break free. She signals Ron all is okay. The suit holds. Jeremiah, now on the surface, intends to test the pressure power sharks would exert on surface swimmers. Val also takes bait, planning to stay near the surface. She explains. Beneath me, a dozen sharks circle, all larger and far more at home in this environment than I am. Unobserved by watchers on deck, a second shark had hit my backside and continued to bump me even though I twisted away. With relief, I feel Jeremiah lift me bodily from the water. It was a very dangerous moment. The shark on my arm required my full concentration and I lost control of myself in the situation. The other shark's teeth had started to penetrate my wetsuit. Serious injury had been a fraction away. Returning to Australia, the tailors motor along the Great Barrier Reef, assured of more opportunities to dive with sharks. They also want to determine if the Maylite will ward off the sharper fangs of deadly sea snakes. 
Snakes usually flee from divers. Val shakes it, trying to make it defend itself, to bite. Always near, Ron records with camera, serves as support should Val need it. With venom ten times more deadly than a king cobra, sea snakes have been responsible for hundreds of fatalities in the Western Pacific. But these have been from bites against unarmored divers. sharks, Val and professional fisherman Alexander Muller troll for tuna. Easily caught in these prolific waters, the tuna will serve as dinner for the crew and bait for the equally hungry sharks. activities attract reef sharks. Alexander attaches the bait to a strong wire without any hook. Ron films the frenzy as closely as possible. Sharks stream in from everywhere, dashing madly, snapping at anything. Ron's only protection is quick reflexes and extremely good luck. Without warning, a massive 10-foot reef shark takes the bait. Rolling and thrashing, it strives to sever the steel wire. Baited without a hook, the monster could easily spit out the bait. But its feeding instinct overrides all reason. Now clad in a full suit of steel, Val stuffs fillets between the wetsuit and the mesh. I dyed my suit straps red because it looks more colorful. But the smell of all the slimy fish takes away the glamour somewhat. It's all part of a special plan. After our successful experiments with deep water sharks, I am determined to coax the reef predators into attacking. Swimmers and divers have more contact with these faster tropical sharks than most other species. It's important to test their reaction when biting the suit. I want this grey reef shark to like me. He is unafraid and takes the fish from my hand. Still without a mesh suit, Ron knows from experience that the sharks will be far more interested in Val, smelling of fish, than in him. Quickly they gather, 
first a five-foot white tip, accompanied by a small remora attached to the shark's underside, on hand to pick up scraps as the shark feeds. straight for Val, wrenching a whole fish from her grasp. rush up from the depths. Ron follows close behind a white tip. Heavily baited with fish, Val becomes the center of activity. Cautiously, the sharks stalk Val's baited arm. Val shoves her arm into its mouth. Instead of testing and quickly letting go, this white tip clamps down and starts to shake, pulling Val from her perch. Struggling to free herself, she breaks loose, her arm aching from the violent action. Composing herself, she signals all is well, casts a furtive glance over her shoulder to see from where a new attack might come. Sensing the bait, the more dangerous gray reef sharks close in, circle cautiously like a pack of wild dogs. Alexander comes from the support boat with more bait wired together. He attaches it securely to the coral head. Taking her still camera, Val backs away to record one of nature's most awesome sights a large school of sharks in a feeding frenzy. Crazed by the smell of blood and excited by the frantic activity around them, the sharks snap at anything, bite each other, call whatever.
takes picture after picture. constantly fend off the curious advances of a six-foot gray reef shark, which can't make up its mind to take the bait or a bite out of Val. The tailors knowing that sharks are attracted to the distress vibrations of a wounded fish instruct Alexander to take the spear gun below. As more sharks quickly gather, Val suddenly finds herself engulfed in a feeding frenzy. She recalls. Suddenly, a shark hits my face, teeth grating against my head. I swim away, dazed, my air supply torn from my mouth. I fight to stay conscious. Blackness threatens to engulf me. I struggle towards Ron, but he is unaware of my distress. My face is in agony as I rush to the surface, life giving air my one desire. Camera still running, Ron swims to her head. Dazed. She gasps for air. Ron grabs her air supply and pushes it into her mouth. Totally exhausted, I drift down, sucking invisible life from my mouthpiece. I wondered if my throat was cut, my jaw smashed. The hardest part was staying conscious. My body desired the relief of oblivion. My mind fought it. It all happened so fast, there was not time to defend myself or even to be sure of what took place. I become aware of one beside me, watching, concerned. There is no fear of sharks. The food is gone and I offer no substitute. Alex helps me out, for I am still weak and dizzy. hurts more from the blow than the wounds. Even speaking is painful. It is only then that the full extent of her danger is realized. Close in, holding bait, she is rushed by the shark, its mouth wide, its teeth surrounding her face. In her chin are four neat incisions. One tooth broke off and is embedded in her jaw. Unseen, unfelt, another shark had struck her leg, actually punctured through a few steel mesh rings. Without her protective suit, she would have been torn to pieces. The final test of the Maylite suit will take place along the coast of South Australia. Here they hope to find the most feared shark in the sea, the Great White. Ron describes. It's simply a matter of hanging chunks of meat over the side to lure the sharks to us. Sometimes we wait a matter of hours or a couple of days, but we know the monsters will eventually arrive. Normally growing from 12 to 14 feet, there have been encounters with great whites ranging to 16 feet in length and weighing over 2,000 pounds, a ton of skillful eating machinery.
too dangerous for a test by valve, a dummy is prepared. Even though the Maylite suit might protect from the sharp teeth, the tailors doubt that anything could survive the crush power of these terrible jaws. suit stuffed with seaweed into the Maylite covering, the tailors plan to film a surface attack by the Great White. There is no meat inside the suit because it has been our experience that an excited white will bite anything, even iron cages. If it were a surface swimming diver, would it survive? is finally spit out and floats mangled to the surface. The suit has survived. It is doubtful that the diver inside could have. and Valerie Taylor, the sea has become a second home. Here they have found a unique occupation, selling their films and photographs worldwide. They have been able to combine their hobby and livelihood. Years of careful observation have provided the experience to judge risk and overcome fear and panic. During the three years spent making this film, we have learned more about the attack patterns of sharks than during the previous 20 years. The most amazing aspect has been the heavy baiting required to cope sharks into biting. Also, the absence of real crush power was a surprise. Wide open, the jaws lack great pressure. Only when almost closed on an arm or a wrist was the crushing effect a problem. This we feel is because the shark uses a soaring motion to sever its prey. More damage was inflicted to my joints by the shaking action than by jaw power. Making this film has been a fascinating and educational experience. I believe we have proved that the steel mesh offers excellent protection against small to medium-sized sharks. I am lucky to have escaped serious injury. Ron, Jeremiah and I strongly advise anyone else against taking this type of risk. We would hate to think some other person sustained grievous bodily harm trying to emulate us.